Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the December 11th, no, well, yeah, December 11th, 2013 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Um, I'd like to call the uh, meeting to order. And our first item of business is to approve minutes from our October 22nd meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. I'll second. Okay. So Josh and Joanna first and second. Any, uh, any comments around the minutes? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Unanimous. Uh, we also had uh, the minutes from our September 24th meeting that uh, was tabled at our last meeting because we didn't have all the participants or many of the participants who were involved in that uh, that meeting. So eyeballing the uh, everybody tonight, it looks like most people were here. Uh, I don't know if, I, I can only assume that uh, uh, yeah, Joanna was not here, Josh, Jeff, Chris, Matt, myself, and Barry. Um, uh, could I get a motion to approve those minutes? Or do we need a moment to read the minutes? <laughs> Say no. I, I was not at the September meeting, I believe. Or was I? Yes, you were. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will move to uh, approve those minutes. Uh, that that inspires a ton of confidence. Okay. Uh, is there a second? I second it. Okay. Any comments on the those minutes? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Those pass. Okay, turning to new business. Uh, our first new business is uh, to hear the request of Timothy Gosh of 1267 Sawyer Road, Map R5, Lot 55, for a home business conditional use permit to operate a repair garage. Uh, Ben, do you want to give us a little brief update? Sure. <clears throat> At our October 22nd meeting, uh, actually, it was not on that. I believe it was the September agenda that uh, Mr. Gosh was in and presented his application. And the board noted uh, a few incomplete items that are required for the review, primarily the site plan, uh, photos of the property, and more details about the nature and hours of operation of the business. Uh, so Mr. Gosh uh, re redid his application with what appears to be the necessary information and is here to represent that information. And, and the, the, when Mr. Gosh came the first time, that was essentially was an administrative appeal on the notice of violation. That's correct. This, this application, um, which we're hearing for the first time, although we, we saw it when it got tabled, is for an application for home use conditional use permit. Yes, and in, uh, in June, uh, in April, I wrote a notice of violation <coughs> for operating a repair garage without an approval. He appealed that notice of violation at the June meeting and it was suggested by the board that he may qualify for a home business. So most of my notice of violation was upheld. In front of you, you have the amended notice of violation. Um, and so he did come back in September for the application for home business. And now he's back one more time with a more complete application for home business. And just to be clear, I think it was in July and August that he was in because I was not at the September meeting and I think I was here both times that Mr. Gosh was mm -hmm. in. And I just want to be clear on that so that I can participate now because I did hear the previous talk. Okay. Okay. 
I think either way you could participate because this is considered a new yeah. application. Okay. Um, fine. Uh, Mr. Gosh, would you like to come up and present your application? Well, my name is Tim Gosh, and I'd like to thank Ben for helping my father and I get this hopefully more complete uh, application. Uh, so I appreciate your help, Ben. Thank you. Uh, my name is Timothy Gosh, and you guys have seen me up here probably more than once now. I live at 1267 Sawyer Road, and uh, I run a little repair shop. It's uh, just a one-man operation. Uh, really don't do really heavy work, just kind of, you know, brakes and inspection stickers. And uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, I keep my property, I think, immaculate. Uh, when I close this time of year, you can't even tell that I'm repairing cars. I've had people come up to me and say, where do you work anyway? I say, I work on Sawyer Road. And they say, we pass by your house every day. You don't work on cars there, do you? And I go, matter of fact, I do. Uh, as you can see by some of the pictures, my neighbors are relatively far away. Uh, noise I keep to a minimum. And uh, I'm very, very particular about any pollutants or anything. Nothing inside the garage gets out into the uh, environment. As you can see, I believe some of the pictures might show grass actually growing right outside the garage, and that's literally inches from the door. Uh, so, like I said, I've, uh, I've been doing this for quite a while now, and I'd like to uh, hopefully get approved. Uh, if there's, um, hopefully the packet's complete, and if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer them. Okay. Thank you. I guess uh, last time I guess, well, I guess to confirm that okay. that this is this is in a uh, uh, residential district with a shoreland overlay, right? Um, and I guess one of the one of the questions I have is the shoreland overlay. Um, district zoning seems to preclude um, auto and service repair. And I wonder if you have any comments around that. Well, I, we uh, the distances, I think, are pretty, f I'm going to call it, it's not like the shoreland overlay is right. It's, I believe, what, 230 feet, if that's, or f depending what they call the shoreland overlay. Is that salt water or? That was one of the things that was brought up. Well, it's yeah. it, you're you're in the overlay district because of the marsh. Correct, which is over I think close to 400 feet away. Could well be. I, I'm not sure that it's prohibited from. The shoreland overlay. Okay. If uh, let's see, section 19611D is prohibited uses in the shoreland overlay. And it says the following commercial and industrial uses are expressly prohibited within the shoreland performance overlay district adjacent to Great Pond and the streams which flow into Great Pond. Mm -hmm. So that list of prohibited uses is specific is, only to is specific to Great Pond and its tributaries. And uh, Mr. Gosh is adjacent to the Spurwink Marsh. Okay. Good answer. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Gosh? No, I think the application is much more complete this time, and I thank you for going through that exercise. Oh, and I said I was. It was much as Ben's help, and uh, so I really said it, uh, it worked out well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just ask you, uh, you have a couple of, uh, we've got a couple of emails of uh, support for your application, and uh, uh, I don't know if, if, if either of the people are here, but um, Mr. Fogg, oh, I guess Mr. Fogg is where you have your Oil, right, right. I try to dispose of my oil properly, right, right. and uh, he's uh, 
he uses a waste oil furnace to long story short so he uh, recycles it okay uh, and then um, uh, Miss Montesano uh, Amonastaso I think it is okay. I don't I can't pronounce it myself real yeah. well join the club uh, is she uh, is she next to you correct 1257 Sawyer correct okay uh, and then uh, uh, Mr. Woodward at 96 Wells I actually is it Mark yep yes yep <coughs> probably not in the butter I'm sorry what's that probably not in the butter I'm sorry I'm he's probably not in a butter he is not he's a couple houses down on Wells Road okay okay John with this usage travel with the property if you sold the garage no it, would someone else be able to continue the business it would be specific no it'd be specific to his business so if he sold it that uh, would be canceled or not canceled but just uh, not renewed you follow me? I, the, the, the approval goes with the land, not with the owner. So that it, it would be. So, Going yes. To, uh, he could sell it as a garage to another owner. If, if Mr. Gosh sells it, it sells it, it, it. But any sale would be subject to the same terms. It would be approved just as a home occupation, just under the terms that we approve. The approval just runs with the land. They, it wouldn't be approved as a commercial garage. So if he sold it. In order for someone to continue the business, they'd have to come before us again? They'd be subject to the same limits in any permit that we might issue as Mr. Gosh would be. But you say limits. So for, for, for sorry to interrupt, but for example, the home business uh, definition number three says that the business or professional use shall not produce any odors, fumes, dust, glare, noise, or electrical interference in excess of that produced by a normal residential use. So one of the restrictions that goes with the business by it per se being a home business would be that none of the noise fumes or anything could really be beyond what you would find at a residence so it couldn't be like a big auto shop I understand but see everyone likes him I knocked on some doors in that area with your butters and uh, I haven't found anyone in the group that were home and I spoke to that didn't like him and didn't feel there was any kind of a problem but if he sells it and some other garage person would operate they may not operate the same way mm -hmm. so that's sort of a it's consideration still have, it's still have the same restrictions on their operation what would the restrictions be we haven't talked about that yet like, like for example um he wouldn't be able to do uh very loud work involving lots of toxic fumes going in the air in any way that that would exceed what's allowed under a home business but that just for uh, because it's a home business or, or any business any garage business well uh only a home business would be allowed here under this conditional use application and it would have to be whoever owns the place and it would have to meet all of it would have to continuously meet all of these criteria so they there are limits on how many employees there can be how many hours there can work how many trips there can be right isn't it something like 10 trips per day I mean, it's, it's very limited. If to fall within the definition of a home occupation, you can't be anything like a commercial garage. Let, let, me, let me do this, Barry. Let, let, let's, let's limit our questions to what we have for Mr. Gosh. We, as a board, we can, when we have our discussion, we can answer your questions and we can come up with if there are additional restrictions or conditions we want to put on, on, the, uh, on the application, we can do that. But I'd like to, at this point, just if we have questions from Mr. Gosh, get those answered so we can move on. Yes, one more question. Okay. Not a question, really, but it's kind of a stretch for a home business. Well, I guess it's defined in the uh, regulation. And what thinks of an accountant, a lawyer, maybe someone well, that sells jam? Uh, I, I would presume that once we're done with the questions from Mr. Gosh, we'll step through the criteria and make sure he meets all the criteria okay, for home let's business. Wait for that, right. But there's home business and home occupation, and when I think of like, someone sitting in their house not really having any clients coming it's more of a home occupation but that's something for Ben um, mr. gosh yes. uh, just to uh, confirm that the total floor area of the dwelling the 3296 that's for the garage only uh, I believe so the was I'm, I'm, I guess I don't understand your so question. on your application total floor area of the dwelling unit, yes yes 3296 and I assume that's for the garage that is correct 
Wait, uh, could you the, is, the garage itself is 3,200 feet? I'm, like, it's like 26 by. So, so the garage is 650 square feet. That's correct. Got it. In, that's, that's what we get from the numbers. In, in the rest of your building. Right. Is right. 3,200. Yeah. Well, I asked a question. Okay. And how many uh, cars do you, uh, or vehicles, do you typically service or inspect in a day? In a course of a week, maybe five. Less than, it's been sometimes two a day, sometimes the, up until, I did, not, I, I did not work for two weeks at all uh, in October. So but, I would say an average one car a day usually gets serviced, unless it's a couple small jobs, maybe a blinker. Yeah. Uh, but generally, if it's something like a brake job, one job a day. And then how many um, customer vehicles do you typically have parked on the site at any given point in time? Depending on the circumstance, maybe two to three. Cars that are parked there, are they visible from the road or are they tucked down in where in that big parking area? E either or. Uh, if some people have health issues and they ask me, do you mind if, if I could pick it up a week from now, then I usually try to tuck those out of sight. Uh, generally, but most people pick it up the next day or that day and those are in that big parking area down in front of the garage. If we were to, uh, so for me, the, the only real concern is um, I always hear in the news these stories about people normally that own a number of cars and they have cars sitting in their, uh, throughout their lot. Correct. And then you end up hearing C, uh, the CEOs come in and they issue complaints saying, oh, you have a junkyard of some sort going on. Um, obviously, you're working on the automobiles. They're supposed to be operational. Uh, my concern ends up being if there are five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen cars ever and what restriction, if any, can we place if we were to approve the application that would be you would be comfortable with with respect to restricting the number of vehicles that can be visible? It's a good question. Uh, mind you, I myself have six or seven cars registered in my name. <laughs> I mean, I, I can put license plates on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I'm, I guess I'm not a hoarder of cars, but I do enjoy having a couple pickup trucks, a couple cars. Uh, especially when you drive older stuff, it's nice having more than one. And you know how they say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mechanic, so sometimes my cars don't get first on the agenda. Uh, so my, I would say, other than my six or seven, maybe five customer cars. Uh, and that, I'm only thinking, and that's worst case scenario, where I've had people say, I'll pick the car up on Tuesday, and they say, geez, my, my, my kid's got this school thing going on. And sometimes I find if it's a person's third car, it's like their dump car, they're not in a rush to pick it up until they need it. And I really, if someone, my business ethics, if they're in no hurry to get it finished, I don't want to be one of those shops that the minute's done, come get it, come get it, come get it, come get it. Because uh, most of my people, they're my neighbors and my friends, and I don't want to be one of those shops that come, come pay me right now. Uh, so I try to really help people. Now, sometimes I've said, it's been here a little long, and, I'll, and I've also had vehicles that they say, can, we, can I drop it off? I go, it's really not that good looking. You know, I mean, it's safe, but you've seen some of those like wooden beds in the back of pickup trucks. I'm like, can you wait to drop that off the day I actually work on it? I really don't want my neighbors seeing that out front. Uh, because most of the cars I do are, you know, they're 2000s, and, a lot of people do drive older cars now, but uh, so I, I do try to keep it to a minimum with it, without offending the, the owner of the car. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the, I guess, the aerial view of your property and uh, look, uh, and, and I just note that it looks like there's a couple, whenever, whenever this picture was taken, um, there were a couple uh, cars parked, looks like, next to a hedge and then three cars in the, in the driveway of your garage. And then I, I note on the other, uh, further to the south, there's another driveway which looks like that's what um, services uh, the house. Correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm just wondering uh, whether the, 
driveway that's uh, for the garage can is typically used for your uh, light repair business or whether that's also where you store your seven cars or generally generally the upper driveway is all personal uh, as a general rule the upper driveway and I consider the upper one that's, is the one, that's that you, the one that's to the south that services the house you can see a walkway running from the house okay to it uh, it's the closest it's the uh, yeah, I guess yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. Okay, yes, it would be. It would be the south. Yeah. And uh, the north driveway, I try to leave open so people can turn around when they. Uh, generally, I always back the cars in, but as a general rule, I try to keep my personal vehicles. I normally do keep one down there. Uh, as you can see, there's like a little blue vi blue blue vehicle outside. That's like if I have to run out to get parts. So I always keep one personal vehicle right next to the garage. Right. But my other personal vehicles are in the uh, upper or south driveway. Okay. okay. So generally, the the, the 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 driveway to the north is used for your business. That's correct. Any other questions for Mr. Gosh from the board? And you you had checked off in the application that nobody who's not a resident of the residents would be working on vehicles? That's correct. You're the only person who does? Me, myself, and I. And the ordinance allows one non-resident to work. Would you be comfortable with the specific restriction that no non-residents work on the cars? The only thing is, is sometimes the, the residents sometimes come and help me work on their own car, unpaid employees. That's one of the reasons why they, hey, do you mind if I come learn how to fix my own car later? And that's one of the things I do enjoy helping people out. It, so as long as it was one unpaid person, but I would feel bad telling someone who wants to learn how to work on that car that I, I can't. Sure. Isn't, it, it, isn't the criteria, one of the criteria for a home business, no one not a resident or, or a dwelling unit shall be involved or employed by the business? Uh, for a home business, it's not more than one, not more than one person who is not. Um, shall be involved or employed. So. so it would allow one. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gosh. Yes. One question. Uh, thank you for coming back and being persistent. Thank you for taking the time to hear me again. Um, uh, I raise this because one of the criteria that we may consider uh, on the application is the hours of operation. And so on the application, it's 10 to 6 p.m., 10 a.m. to 10 to 6 p.m. Is there every day of the week, do you have a restriction in mind what, what is your thinking in there uh, restriction really um, the only time I work past six it's usually during the winter when the doors are shut and it's a person really is in dire need uh, thank you uh, but my query was seven days a week or oh no 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 I generally work maybe four to five days a week but it could be a Sunday and I might not work on a Wednesday okay but, yeah but as a general rule, it's not seven days a week I'm working. I generally work about four or five. Thank you. Thank you. What type of material is the driveway to the garage? Gravel. 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 There is no asphalt. The only, there's not one spec, one square inch, inch of asphalt on the property. Questions for Mr. Gosh, the board. No. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're about to get to the public hearing portion of the program. In fact, we're there. We have <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Uh, what, if you don't mind going to the podium and identifying yourself and where you live? My name is Peter Braun, and I live five, approximately five houses from Timmy on Wells Road, 84 Wells Road. And I've used him in the past. Uh, he's repaired some of my vehicles. And the one thing that I don't like about Tim working there is that when I drive by, I can't tell if he's in there or not. The only way I can tell if he's there is to drive into his yard, walk around the building, because there's no windows to show the lights or anything. There's no noise coming out of it. And I have to go and see if the lock is on the door. If the lock's on the door, I know he's not in there. So the point I guess I'm trying to make here is, it's, it's difficult to know whether he's there or not. I mean, there's, there's always a couple of cars or something in the driveway. 
But, I mean, he does a great job, and I, I think, I, I really would recommend, as a citizen of Cape, that you allow him to do that, because he's done a real good job for me, and, I, and his prices aren't as high expensive as most other people, and so he's doing a service for the Cape residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other uh, public comment, support, or application, or otherwise? Okay. Seeing no one, hearing no one, I'll close the public hearing uh, to the application. Okay. Um, well, I guess the first thing uh, we probably should determine is whether we uh, have a home business, whether it meets the home business criteria or not. Gosh said that there would be himself and perhaps a one other person who on a voluntary basis might help with his or her car but otherwise it's a something as a one-man show uh, I think in the report it showed 900 and something odd average daily uh, trip so um, I think 2% of that works out to 18, so 10 is the max, and he's proposing eight, uh, eight trips, which I, which I assume is four customers a day, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, business or professional use shall not produce odors, fumes, uh, dust, glare, noise, et cetera, uh, outside of normal residential use. Um, He says, it, he says it will not. Um, no His neighbor's testimony supports that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, there are no modifications to the, to the building that we're talking about. Number four. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. That's the only one that gives me pause just with the, the number of vehicles that will be in the yard because of the fact that it also makes reference to off-street parking. Number four, but that's not an external alteration of uh, the building or site. Including the provision of parking in accordance with 1978 off-street parking. So I guess in this situation, is there any requirement that we make sure that there's sufficient off-street parking if there are going to be multiple vehicles parked there for business purposes? Isn't there a pretty good sized parking area though? Mm -hmm. As a matter of just looking at, yeah, there's clearly enough space, but do we have to make sure any criteria are met? I mean, I think one of the things we'll want to consider is, is exactly how many vehicles we're going to allow on the, on the property at a given point in time, which I think some degree would, would address number four. Or customer vehicles. I do think there, it's, there's a little bit of a discrepancy. Certainly the application says four customers per day, but then he also indicated that on average it's one or two, so there might be some room in there. Mm -hmm. But even with four vehicles on the property plus his vehicle, there's certainly yeah. clearly from the aerial room for five vehicles. I, I think four is, uh, def, uh, is met. Uh, it gives me pause as to whether we should set some criteria with relation, yeah. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yep. Okay. Uh, square footage is under 20%. And uh, I don't think he's calling for any sign, so that makes the sign ordinance moot. And I don't believe there's any out, outdoor storage uh, or equipment materials. So I can't hear you. What? He didn't request a sign. So uh, it looks like relative to the home business definition, but for language potentially around number four, um, it would seem to qualify as, as a home business. So, so make that a finding effort.
Can I ask a question? Sure. It, it's actually to Ben. If he violates any of the conditions, what do you do? I would send him a notice of violation to correct whatever he's doing that violates his approval. And then what happens if he doesn't, he ignores it? Uh, we, the, the town could assess fines up to $2,500 per day if the violation persists. Does it become a right, which means it's very hard to take it away once he gets it? No, I mean, See, we can determine if he gets it, but then if he violates, can he sue based upon the fact that it's a right? No, I mean, he, if, if he's approved, he's approved under the strict criteria that we're, that we're looking at now, and if, if he violates that criteria, the town has all the leverage we need to enforce the, the requirements that come with this approval. And since it is a home business, too, I mean, you have the range of penalties that we can impose are from $100 to $2,500 per day per violation, right? So it very quickly would get into a proposition where it's not worthwhile for him to run his business based on the volume that he's seeing in violation of the ordinance because he'd be paying to run his business as opposed to making, he'd be going into the red. Okay, and you said- I don't think there's any way he's making $2,500 per day. But has that, that fine ever been imposed on anybody? Excuse me? Has that fine ever been imposed on anybody? Is it unreasonable to think about it? I'm trying to be practical. No, t towns exercise the right to, to find people under that statute. Has it done it? Uh, I haven't done it in my short tenure here in Cape Elizabeth, but I, I did impose such fines in, in my last position. What's your opinion, John, on that? Well, I, I think that our job is, is to determine whether we're going to grant, in this particular case, um, a conditional use permit or not, uh, on, on, on the merits of the application. It is up to the code enforcement officer to enforce the ordinances of the town. It's, and, and I don't think, uh, so I, I'm, I think you're trying to, Barry, my sense is that what you're trying to do is determine if, if we grant this, is it really going to be enforced or not? And, and that's, I don't think that's within the scope of what this, what this board no, does. We're, we're, we're here to evaluate the merits of, the, of case. the application. I understand, but you know, I'm kind of fearful of encroachment in a residential uh, neighborhood uh, of, a, of a business or whatever. And those are just the points that I'm trying to sort of think about. It, it scares me. See, he's wonderful. I have to use that word. Everyone likes him. I mean, knocking on doors, people really say, gee, he's a great guy. I have no problem with noise or anything. Uh, but if he sells it, he sells the property, and things go with the property, again, maybe you clarified it, because you're, you're, you're a real estate attorney, you're a real estate attorney? Who's a real estate attorney here? You're a real estate <laughs> we, can't, attorney. we can't deny a permit that complies with the ordinance because some other owner in the future might violate the terms of the permit or the ordinance. But it could be a consideration. So if, if it turns out that the next owner is a complete jerk, everyone in town, everyone in Southern Maine dislikes the person, so long as the work continues to be done just in the garage and there's no external noise or fumes or uh, any other, or excessive vehicle traffic that exceeds what they have, what's in the application, and so long as they don't put a sign on the exterior, so long as they don't bring in two additional employees, so long as the new owner doesn't go beyond what's in the application, they can continue to engage in the business if we, we grant the permit. But if they did anything beyond what's in the, the application, they would have exceeded what we granted them. And then Ben would step in and say, you're in violation. And okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I guess the, the next step is whether we um, feel that, that uh, the application's in, in compliance with uh, 1955. And uh, I think that um, I think here, you, I, I think from my perspective, this, this is where it gets into what, what type of conditions 
we're going to put on this to kind of li limit the the the, uh, the the scope of. I mean, this is this is I mean, it's, this is kind of borderline for me where we get into um, you know this it's an RA but district and car, car repair is, is right there on the edge is in terms of whether it's a commercial commercial and industrial use or residential use and and I think that um, you know the applicant has indicated this is you know state inspection light light repair in nature um, and I, I think that um, probably we need I would be more comfortable putting restrictions in place that, you know, in, ensure that, ensure the amount of traffic that's that's in the, in the, uh, at the site and what have you, so. Um. Should we kind of go through two through six first just to make sure we're all on the same page with respect to mm -hmm. generally approving it with some conditions <coughs> and then kind of circle back to conditions? Yes, yes. Um, any conditions prescribed for, for such use will be satisfied. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I guess the first one that, that comes out for me is is creating hazard hazardous traffic conditions. Um, I mean, I, I would say with respect to that one, subject to certain conditions we might place upon um, our approval, um, I, I can at least see, see a situation where the proposed use would not create a hazardous traffic situation, subject to some conditions we might put on. Well, he's saying there'll be no, no not more than than four customers, what amounts to four customers a day. And, you know, I guess, uh, you know, my thought is that, that they're probably, you know, I'd be probably comfortable with not more than, than, than four cars there at any point, at any given point in time. That would mean that he couldn't have any that were from other jobs. Well. That, you know, jobs that have been completed that people are coming to pick up. And, and I guess, I mean, if, are we kind of discussing number two right now? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, just cars that are on the property, to me, don't necessarily create a hazardous traffic condition. Except when they're, you know, well, except when they're coming, coming, coming and going. Right. Right, but which actually goes to one of the criteria of, but as your point, your, uh, number two is focused more on the amount of traffic flow that's occurring. And right. it somewhat goes to my comments about the off-street parking puzzle, because one of the criteria for off-street parking is if it's not residential use, uh, you can't back out onto the street. It has to be designed so that you can pull out, and that would fall into, does it create a hazardous traffic condition if you have vehicles backing out onto square? Sure. And, as opposed to requiring a turnaround of some sort. John, on number two, are we all in a rough agreement that that's not an issue? I think we're in rough agreement that the volume of traffic that's being generated by the business is not an issue, okay. but that the, potentially that the parking and access on and off may be an issue that requires a limit. But I think that goes more, for me, that goes more to five. Uh, I'm sorry, what number, please? Five, um, section five, D5. Compatible with adjacent property. Because there it seems like the number of cars on the property is probably not consistent with the adjacent residential uses. 
So on number three, we're roughly in agreement that that's not the issue. And skipping to four, that's not the issue. And so it's possibly number five. Four um, or f four or five would both fall into the criteria of the number of vehicles on it. Is the issue, let's assume that he has no private fleet of cars, of six or seven, many more than I have. So when you're considering this application, are you thinking in your head, that the, if you're in an aerial view, that he already has six vehicles on the lot? let's say, and that, that it's his own property. So should that or should that not influence the thinking? Uh, and for me, that should not, because it could be how he could have an entire fleet of cars, but that's not the issue. His neighbors may not be able to distinguish or people driving by what is his property versus another, unless you become familiar with his personal property. So the question is that, you know, that for me is a potential problem, because People that may not be in the know may can say, well, he has 20 cars out there. So for me, then, well, it's a slippery slope. How many cars on for four is perhaps on the lower side, because how do you determine what is coming and going? And then four plus is seven, so you have 11 cars on the lot. People are not going to be able to see that it's just. Uh, you make a very. Oh, do you want to you make a very good point, and I want to point out two aspects of the ordinance that come into play with your comment. Uh, number one is the definition of a junkyard. Um, it would potentially be met if two or more of the vehicles remain for six months um, unregistered or without state inspection stickers. But it sounds like that isn't happening. So therefore, if he was just an individual with 50 of his own personal cars, it, it doesn't fall, and so long as they all have stickers, it's permitted. Uh, what is triggered, though, is the parking lot definition, potentially. Parking lot is defined as a lot or part thereof used for or designed for the parking of three or more vehicles in conjunction with use other than a single family home. So if they're all, 50 vehicles are on the lot and they're all his and it's a single family home, it doesn't meet the criteria of parking lot. But if instead it's three vehicles that are being used with the auto repair business, we've triggered the parking lot definition. What are the ramifications of triggering the parking yeah. lot definition? I think, I don't know, I haven't <laughs> through, but I, think I guess I how I think of it plan. is that to the extent we're putting limitations on a home business, the limitations have to be applicable to customers and business. They can't be, you know, like a personal vehicle that's being used for the business. It can't apply to his personal fleet of vehicles. The other thing is that... Um, Unless he has them all registered as uh, commercial vehicles that's <laughs> associated right. with the business. So on the parking lot, in the generic term, the driveway on the left is included in the assessment of the parking lot space for the garage on the right. So even though there's a tr couple of trees, I think there's, um, there may be two entrances off the road, but for the purposes of this ordinance, it's the number of cars for that total property. Right. Right. Is that, or is that an open question? It, it, uh, I would interpret parking lot as his personal cars don't trigger the parking lot definition. It's, Even, okay, it's fine. Only the only the business related. Cars. Okay. So if we say five cars, then it is, I would say that it is triggered as parking lot. And then we have to figure out what that means. If the restriction was set as only two cars, uh, are allowed outside and one's in the, in the shop, maybe, making three in total, then I would say parking lot is not true. <laughs> does, does that answer your question? It does. It, it, it really gets down to how complicated we wish to make this. It is uh, a straightforward application for me. I want to make him have a, a, a Sears go as a business and generate taxes, great. Um, but then, you know, I don't want him to be limited on the business that he takes in by saying that he can only have three, two or three cars at any time on his property. That's considered customer-based. I, I would say the problem is that the ordinance itself says that the moment you have more than two vehicles parked for non-residential purposes, it's considered a parking lot. And we, in, in approving it, we need to make sure that whatever restrictions exist for the approval of the parking lot, they're met. Well, we don't know what those are, and they might just apply to site plan approval and planning board approval. We don't really know. Which, yeah. Um, <laughs> I personally would be pretty comfortable limiting the business-associated park vehicles on the property overnight, meaning not his personal vehicles, to six vehicles. 
That would give him the four that he has on any given day plus two people that in any given week he's got 20 people coming in there. That's 10% that maybe want to leave theirs there for an extra night and not come pick it up, which I personally have done multiple times. So that would give him a little bit of leeway for two extra people. And then if that gets to be unduly burdensome, he can use that as a reason for calling them and saying, you know, I hate to dun you, but I'm running up against my six number and I'm not allowed to do that. I like Just that. throwing it out there. <laughs> well, in just thinking that through, so, so you conceivably have seven cars in, in, that, in that space at a given point in time. You've got his car, you've got two that are overnight, and four that come in during the day. If I'm doing the math right. Okay. And so, as I then go and I look at my picture of that area, I, I, I guess I, I'm, I, I struggle still with whether it, it's, it's not creating a hazardous traffic condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I see two parked up against whatever that is, let's say a hedge, but whatever it is, I see two parked in the, against the hedge and I see three in the driveway. And the two that are in the drive, two of them that are in the driveway now, um, you know, they, they could pull it, you know, they can pull into the lawn and back, you know, back up and go out, go out the front way. So there's enough room for them to kind of uh, turn around, you know, in the driveway as, as opposed to backing out on the, onto, um, help, whatever road that is. Is it, is it worthwhile to have a condition that cars are prohibited from backing out into the road? I, I think the ordinance already says that they're not allowed to. So it would be redundant with what's already in the ordinance. Um, yeah. There's no harm in citing that portion of the ordinance and just repeating it. 1978 subsection C1. Um, I think those are the only two factors. The two factors that could make it hazardous are the number of trips or backing out into the roadway. And the trips are clearly not an issue. I don't think people back out. I, I think everybody turns around. I don't think Mr. Gosh would have a problem with enforcing that if necessary. Yeah, he has control over that. You know, he backs them in, they're going to drive out. You know, no one's going to turn their car around so they can back out. <laughs> CEO. Uh, 1961, the residential A, uh, the residence A district. Subsection B, permit uses, number four, accessory uses. Are you there? Yes. First one, little A, following accessory uses are permitted. Accessory building structure for use. It seems like, have you ever had to interpret that? It seems like it just swallows itself. I agree. So, can you go to say again, as to what is meant by that? Because I, I mentioned that because the off street parking section states that uh, off street parking shall be considered an accessory use when required or provided to serve any legal use located in a zone. So, I'm wondering whether parking lot. Um, I'm trying to uh, just satisfy myself that parking lot is a permitted use in the zone. And I'm wondering if A satisfies that. Is parking behind as a use? 
1978 says off street parking shall be considered an accessory use when required or provided to serve any legal use located in any zone except this. Off street parking is a different time term than parking lot, right? Um, good point. So it's cool. Off street parking is an accessory use and parking lot is. I do think it falls within that within section. That. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe that definition should be redefined. Right. So, just staying with the with the with the hazardous traffic conditions, and, and whether there's a, a vehicle limitation that helps address that. You're, you're suggesting six. I worry that 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 many vehicles is going to make it difficult to be able to turn around. I, I kind of started at four, um, you know, and I guess as I think that through and stare at the map a little bit, you know, presumably there's always one in the garage. So, you know, you'd really have three out there. You probably could get, I, I think as long as there are four out there, you have enough room to, to turn around. So, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm personally more comfortable you know, putting a limitation of four vehicles in the, you know, in the, in the uh, drive, in the garage driveway area at, at any point in time. I still make some parking lot, huh, Chris? That's my big concern. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with, every, with every, I, I think everything is met with the exception of I'm concerned that it triggers the definition of parking lot and I'm uncertain whether we have the ability to approve something that meets that definition. I mean, imagine instead he was asking for 20 cars. Uh, it, it begs the question whether we're moving outside of the definition of home business by virtue of this being the door of parking lot. The, under the definition of home business, under the definition of home business, Number four specifically states that it, that you must comply with Section 1978 off street parking. So it so it, that gives the board the right to entertain that because it's part of the definition that the zoning board hears. Is that in? Have you had to deal with 1978 as of yet, such that you can say whether it's something that we can address, or is it something that's supposed to be done by the planning board? And feel free to say that it was a part of our research. It seems like it seems like planning board is only used when when an applicant wants to waive requirements from from those standards. It, it doesn't say specifically that the planning board administers those standards anywhere. So we probably would just need to review subsection C to make sure that those criteria are met. Wait, we're reviewing whether this meets the parking lot standards? Uh, off street parking, yes. Oh. What is it, 19? 1978 for off street parking and then subsection C design standards for off street parking. It, it does state that a labeled handicapped parking spot needs to exist uh, at, at, the, at the beginning of the section in section There's B. There's got to be exemptions for that for home businesses, though. I don't think home well, businesses are subject to the ADA. Un under, under this same section, it says that the requirement for home businesses is to have two spaces in addition to required parking for the residents. This requirement may be reduced by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So, so there is a specific requirement separated out in here for home businesses. And we're already talking about that, so that requirements met. So he so he meets 
the minimum Somewhere. minimum requirement of this section as it relates to home businesses. Okay, you're, what, you're, what's the section you're in? Page 165. It's 444. Yeah, one. Yeah, one. Yeah. A, B, A. Two spaces in addition to required parking for residents. This So he is in compliance with with that particular provision, but I'd say we should also look at the subsection C, which is the next page. That's commercial, though, isn't oh, it? Oh, off-street parking design standards. Yeah. Oh. Phone. Chris, you, when you read that provision on the C, uh, shall apply to all new and expanded. Mm -hmm. This, because it's a change of use. It now becomes a new or expanded, even I'd though it's pre-existing. I'd say it's it's new because it's a new. Well, that's the question. It was a it's a ongoing use that was not previously permitted, because it's I would deem this a new permitted use. So all are new. So the use that we're talking about is the garage to operate a business. It's the a lot that we're talking about has always been parking cars. So that the actual textual aspect hasn't changed. But it's the parking of cars that are there for non-residents. Yeah, I know. But if you look at these design standards, I mean, they're clearly not talking about home businesses. Once you get onto this next page, you have to have wheel stops, curbs shall be placed, travel aisles need to be clearly delineated. I completely agree with you that the ordinance is not the uh, model of clarity. I would point out, though, that the home business section explicitly references this section of the ordinance as to what needs to be met. It doesn't point specifically to subsection C, but it does point to 1978. And then, well, but there's certainly. Okay, so we're looking at 1978, and we're looking at the home business definition, and it says to. And I'm just saying, uh, and it doesn't then reference the design initially. criteria. But it says that the following design standards shall, they use a shall now, might uh, apply to all new and expanded off street parking areas. So I'm just saying perhaps we should step through those eight criteria to make sure that they're met. Oh, the, the eight criteria I think to see. What I'm yeah. saying is that I don't I mean, think not. that they apply. And there's no, I, I mean, there's no reason to step through them because <laughs> he does, it's not, they don't, he doesn't comply. So, well, I'm saying it, it, it says shall. It says they shall apply to, to, it, so to my new and expanded off-street parking areas. This Correct. is this not a new use. or expanded off-street parking area. And why is it not a new or expanded off-street parking area? It's because an existing it's in existence but it was it's a, not being built existed not permitted off-street parking area there was never an issue about the parking it was the underlying associated use but the, par the parking I disagree has been with that. permissible all along I disagree with that because if it's parking you could have 12 people come and park in your house right now for residential purposes mm -hmm. but if you're doing it for commercial purposes then you're it's not permitted the parking? Correct. No, it's the underlying use that would be that would be a problem. He wouldn't be writing people up for parking there. I would say that yes. The notice of violation have, makes no reference to parking issues. This particular notice of violation, but a notice of violation could be issued if if I were to open up my yard and tell people I'm now allowing people to park in my lot. Then you'd be creating a new off-street off parking area. Parking. He, this is a this is a system. gravel parking area. It's not a lawn that's now being used to park cars. So you're trying to say by virtue of the fact that there's already gravel there. Uh, but the problem is that that was all created because he was parking cars there and using it for parking spots historically without when it was, approval. I mean, well, we don't know. I mean, we don't know when not, this not for, started. Not for a business use. Well, you, well we you, don't know that. We don't know why there was a large area on which cars were so, parked. So you're trying to say perhaps the parking area was done for a residential purpose and now all that's happening is it's switching from a residential pur it's purpose to a, a commercial the, purpose yes. and that's it's not creating The point is it's area. existing. It is existing and I believe that the first time he was here there was testimony to the effect that his dad or someone was a long distance trucker and needed the parking for storage of a big truck, an 18-wheeler, and so that parking has been there for quite some time. 
It does say under subsection A, though, that off-street parking shall be provided for all new construction expansions and changes in use in accordance with the requirements and standards in this section. And there's a change in use. I just wanted to. I'm the only make, one who thinks this applies. We should. No, I, I think um, there's a point here. I think for the purposes of the definition of a home business, mm -hmm. what does that entail? All right. It just so happens that this particular home business is not one that we typically see as home business, but it, but it does meet the requirements as we currently discussed. The query is, and if if we decide that there's it's a parking lot requires capital improvements to have a business. A home business require, yeah, home business. There's a dichotomy here that's not comfortable. And so I, I'm not suggesting that he has a home business and then he has to make capital improvements to parking lot, to have a parking lot. My, my question, I don't see, if, if we step through this criteria, it's not clear that there is any need for the capital improvement. All of them may already be met. We haven't even looked at it, that's my point. Well, he doesn't have. What, for, for example, parking Real stops. The ability, but their only uh, wheel stops shall be placed where needed to prevent encroachment into walkways, landscape circulation, miles, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's met. Street so, structures? I mean, where, where's street structure? No, but streets then, and structures. But I then we. are going to be up against a building. Further, we'd fail on this application. Sorry, the applicant would fail on the application because there's no evidence saying that there's proper drainage. There's no drainage. Uh, so why don't we just stop where we're, where, where we're chatting here now because we haven't met these requirements at all, or, or arguably at all. Well, he told us that it's gravel, which would withstand um, vehicle loading and winter maintenance. I think we um, have an application in front of us. We've reviewed the application. We've determined that it meets the definition of home business. We're looking at the conditional use standards that apply. We're determining whether there are conditions that should be imposed or not. And I think that going beyond that into parking territory that applies, that personally I don't think applies, um, is spinning our wheels at this point. And if everyone else has that view, let's move on. But I would note that home business subsection 4 explicitly says that any exterior alteration of the building or site, including the provision of parking in accordance with 1978 off-street parking, shall not distract from the residential character of the neighborhood. But none that of that is being done. It doesn't. Read it again. Read it again. Out loud again. You're it's focused on the alt exterior, alteration. Uh, external alteration. It's That's not being doing. altered. But it's a change in use. The underlying use is being changed, but not the parking. I, I, look, I, I guess, I, I, well, I, I think we've hit spinning of the wheel mode. And, and I, I think that, um, I mean, I think when, we, when this gets down to a vote, then people can express I'm for it or against it for the following reasons. And that, that can certainly be one of them. But I think we've, um, I think we've beaten that one to, to death. And I, and I think, um, you know, rel relative to the to the conditional use standard on number two, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll in the interest of moving on to the other standards, um, I'll say that I th I think you know I, there needs to be some limitation of vehicles at any given point in time, um, and you know, from from my perspective, um, you know, I think the limits is, is not more than five at any point in time, and if people have other views on that, we we can discuss it and. Do you mean five um, home businesses that are business, not personal, or? Five on the garage side. <laughs> <laughs> we may have to make that distinction, but, but that's, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm saying. On the, on the north, the north side of that, of the, uh, the uh, uh, aerial. Um, uh, let's just keep going through these. On number three, proposed use will not create any unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage emissions in the area, other aspects of this design or operation. Um, we've got uh, in the application that uh, all the oils moved off site, um, you know, the, uh, all, all fluids are, I'm, you know, we've got a representation from the vendor that takes it in. Um, I think that that's, you know, I, I'm satisfied with, with, with that. Um, I don't know how other people feel about about that particular conditional use. Um, uh, 
pro proposed use will not adversely affect the value of the adjacent properties. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know. My own feeling is it's, it's generally consistent with how it's been used in the past. And, and just given the character of the property, yeah. I mean, this would be an entirely different story if this was in a different neighborhood where the houses were on top of each other and there were attached garages. But given the character of the property, I think okay. you know, it doesn't affect the value. Uh, proposed site plan layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. talking about the site plan and layout, then yes. I think on six, the design and external appearance of the proposed building, I mean, it's the same building, so it's, that's kind of a moot point. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, how to, I know the applicants, uh, I think, said that, well, the application says 10 to 6 for hours of operation, no sign. How do people feel about the hours of operation? Generally, putting aside days or how many days of the week? Get to that next. With respect to hours, I'm comfortable with 10 to 6. With respect to days, I think we need to discuss that. Okay. Five days a week? Excluding. Sorry, John. If Monday to Friday, half day Saturday. Um, I mean, I think mon I, I, some of this becomes the applicant's personal preference in terms of yes. what works on it, and that's I, I don't want to. Uh, I mean, my, my concern with the hours of operation isn't so much with when he's actually working on the vehicles because. Everything that we've heard is that that's pretty much unnoticeable to anybody who is around. If, if, if he's working in there, everything's closed. You don't hear anything. There's no, nothing's going on that you can tell that there's work going on inside. But my concern with the hours of operation would be people coming and going at times that other people in the neighborhood may not want people coming and going to a mm -hmm. business. And I note, to uh, just uh, reiterate what you said, um, to the extent that it was generating noise in odors or anything like that after hours, you've already violated the home business definition anyway. So, so it is all just about people coming and going. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not, if he's working on a Sunday, but he's not violating the ordinance by making any noise, then I don't have a whole, I don't have a big problem with him working on a Sunday. So the, is so what I'm hearing is that there's a flexibility of five days. He can pick the five days. Well, I think you're hearing this. I think there's flexibility as to the five days. I think there's less flexibility as to when the cars are flowing in and out of there. I see. I mean, I, th I, think, I, think, that, I think that's what I was hearing. That that's, would be my view. I mean, I, I think that if... Um, so, it gets back to a very point. Uh, so how do you police it? That's not really up to us. Right. Someone complains, they bring it to the CEO, the CEO. Fine. Yeah, go Fine. He might. He's asked for the hours, he's asked for the days. Well, he's, asked, he's asked for the hours, he hasn't asked for the days. Oh, okay, but ever found a garage that opened at 10 o'clock to bring your car there? How practical do you want to be? I mean, we're not trying to help him run his business. But I just think someone saying 10 o'clock you have to open a I just don't think it was a practical thing. Well, that's, but that's, that, that's the owner's prerogative. It's, it's, the if, if, so if, it's, it's the earliest he could open it. And the, 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 to, to me, I guess the, the, I, I'm fine with hours of operation of, 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 of 10 to 6, um, uh, five days a week, but with a the further limitation that, that I'm not sure how this, this won't come out right the first time, probably even the fifth time. But, um, but but uh, clients uh, clients will need to drop off their cars Monday through Friday. 
Okay. That would be. No work on Saturday. No okay. Saturday. Although people like to pick the cars up on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I've. <laughs> I mean, I could. You know. One then we can just say uh, uh, can pick their cars up um, except for Sundays. Don't we kind of get to that by limiting the number of cars that can be on there? I mean, if we're putting a limit on how many cars can be there in the first place, then we kind of know that there's not going to be that much traffic. I mean, even if all five people came to, if there were five cars there, he was totally maxed out, and all five people came to pick up their car on Sundays, is five more cars on Sawyer Road that big of a deal? <laughs> Even on Sunday. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more than five more, just because somebody going to pick up a car is bringing an extra car right. to the site. So it's it, it's not a huge. Unless they're walking, because they're Unless neighbors. They're, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. It's not bottles. <laughs> no. Right. Okay, so we're saying five, well, we're saying six days a week then? I'm comfortable. Six days a week exclusive of Sundays? It's open for discussion still. If you would yeah. And should we uh, actually say fine? Because I, I did hear the applicant say sometimes he works on the cars on Sundays. And I'm not trying to preclude when he works on the car. Should we just say exclusive of Sundays for customer customer pickup and drop off, customer traffic? Yes. So, John, just to reiterate, you're saying you're suggesting six days of operation. 10 to 6 of when he's actually open, potentially open. Mm -hmm. Customers can drop off or pick up that car only during the hours of operations between 10 and 6, Monday to Saturday. Yes. Okay. I think that's what I'm saying. Whoa, <laughs> or suggesting, anyway. That's really restrictive. I never pick up my car in the hours of operation. <laughs> when do you pick up the When do you pick up <laughs> I pay by credit card and have them leave the keys in it. So I, can do again. <laughs> I mean, you have a good point. I often drop my car off at seven o'clock in the yeah. morning on my yep. way into work and yep. pick it up at eight o'clock at night. Yep. It gets well, back into this is a home business. That's true. So, whereas the people wish to sleep in late versus having a, a car being picked up and dropped off, and what have you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm still comfortable with it. I too drop it off at night and pick it up early, what have you. But yes, um, yeah. It's also what you're asking. Yeah. Right, so. The hours of operation were, but I doubt that he was contemplating that the people that are, I mean, this is kind of his This is when friend. he's saying he will work as opposed to when right. the customers are picking. Exactly. I, I and us tying the two together, I think, is pretty restrictive okay. for him because yep. These are his neighbors and his friends who kind of right. are probably used to just dropping them off and so, leaving the keys so, right in the so, so are we back to hours? I mean, the application says hours of operations, 10 to 6, Monday through Saturday, exclusive of Sunday? And, let's, and then just leave it and at just that. leave it at that? How about the number of employees? Let's discuss that next. I, I, the, the application explicitly says there will be no one employed uh, who is not residents. So the application is for zero employees. Notably, if the owner of the car is there also engaged in it, they wouldn't qualify as an employee. Did you say they wouldn't? They, I, I don't think they would be. I don't either. So yeah. There could, there could be a we'd simple. We'd have to ask Ben, though. So. There, there could be a simple condition that just states the, the use adheres to the application. It doesn't exceed what is represented on the application. And, and I, I, would, I would be in favor of something like that because one of Barry's concerns is that somebody else moves in yeah. and wants to continue this use and I'm okay with that as long as it's the owner of the, the new owner of the home who continues to do the work I'd like to avoid a situation where somebody purchases it says oh wow I can hire a mechanic and put him out in my garage and earn some income by having somebody out in my garage working on cars all day yeah. So if we restrict it to the application as stated, 
Yeah. Then no. I never thought of that. In other words, you could create a rental property. <laughs> and, and that, See what you've done? <laughs> an interesting aspect. Buy the house and then lease it to a, uh, a mechanic. And that another reason why the 10 a.m. number is, is, is a good number because if someone wanted to be run a serious garage, they're going to want to open at 7 or 8 in the morning. And Mr. Gosh said he has no interest in doing it more than five days a week, so a restriction of five days per week with, without naming the days would be sensible. So if the use flips and someone tries to run it intensely for seven days a week, it would be... A trigger. Good point. Okay, so I've got at this stage three potential conditional conditions to the application. Um, no. I can't read my own writing. Um, all vehicles are prohibited from from backing out of the driveway. Uh, hours of op uh, uh, hours of operation is limited to six days a week, exclusive of Sundays. Uh, and the conditional use is limited to the application as stated. Any, any other conditions that come up in the context of the conditional use standards that we want to address? Let me put this out there as for a potential change in whether the, the board has this power. I know that he has no, has indicated no employees, but there will come a time if he continues to do this line of business for let's say 10, 15 years, he may need an assistant that does not live on the property. So if he says now that it's going to be no employees, 10 to 15 years from now he will get older, he will not be able to do it as what he used to do. As an issue of protection, for his running of his business, he will either stop or have to sell the property or do something else. For a potential point that we're thinking about all these other things and conditions, I, I'm suggesting that maybe we should just leave in a possibility if he wishes to employ one employee to anticipate a future uh, issue. I would say that if that future issue arises, he would come back to whatever uh, zoning board exists at that time and request a change. Yeah, I agree. I would agree. One of your conditions, are, are you saying he can't operate, he cannot operate on Sundays? You said exclusive of Sundays? That's what it said. Five days, six days a week exclusive of Sundays. And that, okay. I just, okay. I just wanted to be clear on I, that. I mean, I think we, we kind of went back and forth in terms of his hours of operation 10 to 6 are for him, but we're trying to what we're trying to, maybe there's a bit not, better way to, 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 to say it or write it, but what we're trying to do is limit the traffic, um, you know, so people can come in any, 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 any time, any day of, of the week, recognizing that, that Mr. Ghosh, you know, he, he very well could work on the cars on Sunday. Well, I don't think that's what we're saying then. If we're saying the hours of operation are exclusive of Sunday, I think we need to have it say that pickups and drop-offs can be six days a week exclusive of Sunday. He can work seven days a week. He can work day, whatever day he yeah. wants. That's a good point. Uh, um, so sorry, I think there's a provision in the ordinance that says the commercial businesses um, cannot operate in certain hours of the day. Uh, it's it's after seven. It's not a commercial Paraphrasing. By analogy here, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so wouldn't that carry uh, apply here? It's, it's, um, well, I know that for construction purposes, they can't uh, operate before seven or I think it's seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's the miscellaneous offenses ordinance and primarily speaks of noise and construction noises specifically referenced, but I, I don't think that would apply to cars pulling in and out of a driveway. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question to Ben. Yes. Ben, can you restrict management to Mr. Gosh? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think... No. 
I, I think it would. Can we restrict it just to Mr. I, I don't know if we'd have the authority to do that. I think, the, I think the approval needs to be for the land. Okay, thank you. All right. Are those are the questions we need the CEO or the town attorney to weigh in on for. Uh, does this work as going back to the, to the hour limitation? I don't know if it does. Hours of operation for customer pick up and pick up and drop off is limited to six days a week exclusive of Sunday. Can you read it again? Sorry. Sure. Hours of operation for customer Four. pick up and drop off is limited to six days a week exclusive of Sunday. You want me to say something? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's just a logic point. If it's six days and you exclude, it can, I, mean, I think the issue is that if you say excluding Sunday, you know it's six days out of the week. Well, then it could be any week. six of the seven. You're just saying, but if you've saying already excluded six days a week, excluding Sunday, saying six days a week is redundant. We can just say excluding Sunday. Exclude, any day excluding Sunday. I get credit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other discussion, questions on this application? Okay, could I have a motion uh, on the application? I move to approve the application with our conditions as you drafted and read a moment ago. And bef before that seconded, have, we haven't touched any condition as to the amount of parking. Right. Or was that condition listed? We did, but we didn't put in the conditions. Thank you. Good catch. So that was we were, we were limiting the number of vehicles on the site at any point in time to five. I thought you read that. I didn't know. I, I, well, I, a long time ago. But I didn't put it down in a little handy dandy condition sheet. So. so it would be limited to five vehicles at any point in time. And that's where I. That's where I'm, I would say if it's two, I'm comfortable with it. And once it exceeds two, I become concerned that we're exceeding what we're allowed to do. Because at that point, I think it triggers parking lot, which I don't know the ramifications of that. Well, and I, and, and I hear you, and I'll just say in response that I, I think that Within that section, there is a there is a provision for what the parking has to be for a home business, and which, which is two, which is a two. two, a minimum of two. Does it say minimum? Minimum requirements for off street. The two spaces falls under the two spaces in a, two spaces in addition to required parking for residents. This requirement may be reduced by the ZBA. Isn't that section entitled minimum? Yep. yep. The following minimum number of spaces rounded blah 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 blah. Just when I think of a home business, I'd also note that uh, like the town center, I think it's the town center area has a, um, one of the uses that's allowed in the town center is entitled repair garage, which is something that's not defined anywhere in the ordinance, I don't think. So if that's listed as a, a, a use, um, and we're already kind of saying this is a home business, not a repair garage, because otherwise we have, I think, issues approving a true repair garage in, in the RA since it's not listed as a use. If this is a home business, the moment we exceed two spots and it starts falling into the definition of a parking lot, when I think of a home business, I don't imagine something where there's five different commercial vehicles involved. It's kind of exceeded the definition of a home business at that point. But the parking standards for home businesses specify that two is the absolute minimum. Correct. But it and that they need to come to us to have less than two. And then so having more than two 
by definition is not unusual for a home business. I'm saying that at the moment you exceed to, you have then triggered parking lot and it has become a parking lot and there's probably additional review and criteria that need to be met if you're creating a parking lot in a residential district. And we think, although it's possible that parking lot might be something that is just planning board review. But I don't know the answer to that. And that's why I, I get hesitant to go over to. Okay. For, for purposes of the join us first, I will read the conditions again. So the conditions are uh, one, all vehicles are prohibited from backing out of the business's driveway. Uh, two, uh, Hours of operation for customer pickup and drop off is limited to six days a week, exclusive of Sunday. Three, use is limited to the application as stated. Four, limited to not more than five vehicles uh, for the home business and not more than four in the driveway. Maybe no one else has asphalt? There is no asphalt. We should, I know there isn't, I heard it, but can you limit it for not being asphalt added? No. On um, the first condition, can you add customer vehicles? Can you add customer in front of vehicles? Is everyone okay with that? Customer vehicles are prohibited from backing out of the business driveway. Do we want anybody to back out? We don't, but we can't, like if someone back pulls in and then uses it to turn around. Okay. All customer vehicles are prohibited from backing out of the business's driveway. Okay. Do I have a second for the motion? I second it. Joanna first, Matt second. Okay. Any further discussion? I'd simply note that if it was set to three where one vehicle's inside and two are outside, I'd have no problems. But because it's exceeding that, that's why, why I'm going to vote no for that reason, solely that reason. And if it ends up losing, I would be open to revoting if the, the limit was lowered. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all in favor of the motion as presented? One, two, three, four, all opposed. Chris and Barry. So the application passes four to two. Okay. So I will read the uh, finding of facts and the conditions again. This is a request for a conditional use permit for a home business at 1267 Sawyer Road. Map R5, lot 55. Timothy B. Ghosh is the owner of record for Map R5, lot 55. The proposal is consistent with the definition of home business found in section 19.13 of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. For the proposal satisfies the requirement of section 19.55 conditional use permits for the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Um, as modified by the following four conditions. One, all customer vehicles are prohibited from backing out of the business's driveway. Two, the hours of operation for customer pickup and drop off is limited to six days a week, exclusive of Sundays. Three, use is limited to the application as stated. Four, uh, limitation to not to not more than five customer vehicles uh, no I'm sorry five vehicles uh, and four and four in the drive four in the business's driveway okay and the, mo the motion carried uh, the application carried four to two read the section on signs again I'm sorry on what? Was there a restriction against signs? The, there's, there is in the application. Okay, can you put a, a, a number? 
There's no need to put a number. He, he, he said no sign in the application. So if he were to add a sign, he'd be in violation of what we are. Don't you think it's reasonable to have a number? If, if he wanted to, he'd have to come back to us to request. If he wants any modification on the application, he'd have to come back to us, Barry. Okay. Okay. We're running up and down looking for the number. <laughs> and with that, uh, Mr. Gosh, your application is approved. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. I Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're welcome back anytime. Will I see something in the mail regarding Board Member Monroe's report of the Board of Monroe Search? Will I be getting something in the mail regarding that? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, to hear the request of Mark Toothacre of Two Wheeler Road, Map U16, Lot 1, for a variance to construct a 12 by 27 sunroom. Uh, Mr. Toothacre. Thank you all for your time. Yeah, thank you. The request is just that. We want to put a 12 by 27 foot sunroom on the back of the house, the two lights road side of the house. Um, we actually picked the house up about 15 years ago and moved it, swung it around and made it into what it is today. And uh, this is the final project that we're going to do on the house before I retire. So uh, I thank you for your consideration. I do have a comment on this. Uh, the the survey was the the site plan that you have is not a true boundary survey. The surveyor was late getting that in. I just got the real surveys in today, and it is more accurate than the one you have in your packet. Ben, could you comment on the, the current proposed rear setback? Um, what, is that 120, 17? What, do you know what that number is? Or otherwise, the applicant, if you could comment on The application says setbacks from property lines in the middle of the page. It says current, says the front is 14. And then on the rear, it, um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us what that number is. 17 is what I thought, but. 17 feet? Yeah. The rear is? No, wait a minute, 120 feet. See, I wasn't sure Got it. exactly what they were when I filled that out. Um, and I went from the last time, I believe, then that uh, we uh, went to the zoning board to have the house picked up and moved and where we set it. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I included the findings of fact from his prior zoning board meeting in the packet. Uh, they did a, 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 a reconstruction relocation back in 2000. So it's 17 from? The survey shows it 22.9. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, 22. Well, we have more accurate information now. And today is the first day that we have this survey information. So some, some of the information on the application and some of the information that was heard at the zoning board in 2000 is, is inaccurate. Got it. So we should go by this. We should, this, this yeah. Okay, so it's, so it's. Uh, so the, pun the punchline is that the proposed setback from two lights at its closest location is going to be 22.9. Correct.
So the, the, um, the request in the written paperwork says, in order to construct an addition on the side rear of the house, the applicant is requesting a variance that allows a setback of 14 feet on the two lights side of the property. Is it, is it going to be 14 or 22? 22. 22. Only 20, so it's not, uh, so less than what was, what's listed here. You only need 22, not 14. Yeah, 22.9 is what it says. Yeah, we change that number. And the, the deck is, the deck's existing or that's, that's a new addition as well? Existing. Existing? Yes. that will be 22.9 is the existing dwelling is already within the required setback, right? Yes. Well, it, it was in, it, it was placed exactly where we had to place it uh, the last time we had the appeal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. The original approval, did the original approval contemplate <coughs> the addition at the time? No. Yeah, okay. Again, why we call two lights road the front instead of Wheeler Road? Well, they, they're both. The, the front setback applies to both, and uh, they the, did 40 on two lights and 30 on Wheeler. Yeah, and and the front setback varies depending on the intensity of the road. So the so Wheeler Road has a front setback of 30, and and two lights has 40. If it was 30, it would meet it everywhere except for the corner of the new deck, the oh, new addition. The, the addition, right. So the, the historical record is uh, an application was made back in 2000. At that point in time, they asked to relocate the, the building so that it was 17 feet from Two Lights Road. It ended up actually being farther than that from Two Lights Road, even though they approved as close to 17 feet. Mm -hmm. um, when I was looking at the application earlier, it's although it looked like they're now seeking to go to 14 feet, which would be closer than what was approved in 2000. In actuality, it's only 22.9, so it's still going to be not as close as what was approved in 2000. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I just showed my cards. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. No, you can send us over early. <laughs> Any other questions for the applicant, or are we still digesting the information? Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, any uh, comments from the uh, public? Seeing none, hearing none, I'll close the public forum portion of the program. Okay. Uh, I guess we all agree you should be here for a variance, even though it was approved back in 2000. <laughs> if, if the action in 2000 was a variance, then I, I wouldn't have brought him in here. I would have said you've you oh. you, you've got that. That was that. a relocation. Got it. But got that it, that it. was a relocation. Got it. If 
but in in 2000 you did have a structure that was actually encroaching in the two lights road right of way and the zoning board said you you can move that back you have to be at least 17 feet from the two lights road right of way it, is there now there's no right of way well it, oh, I guess is this the right of way here mm -hmm. But this is really this is from oh. this is from his property line. He's measuring from the property line, huh? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. So it was even closer prior to the relocation. They said move it back as part of this relocation. It was moved back and it moved back farther than than was needed. Right. Correct. And now we're kind of saying, oh, we'll let you move a little bit closer. To what was? But still well outside. Well, but still further than what they approved. You know, correct. Back in two thousand. So. I note that normally I would say, oh, let's go through 19.52 and step through all the different criteria of the undesirable change. Let's look at the closest 10 houses and whatnot, but I'd but, be more flexible by virtue of the prior decision saying 17. You know, if we'd only known that. <laughs> <laughs> How easy it could have been. <laughs> uh, so should we step through the... Um, the uh, criterion for a variance in this. Uh, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. I would say it certainly is a non-conforming lot. It's definitely an, an unusual definitely in, lot. Definitely unique. Yeah. I, had, I, had, I had to drive by it today because I could not figure out where it was. And, once I got the visual, I was like, got it. <laughs> Pass it every day. Um, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. So that's the one where the definition of undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood re requires us normally to look at the result of the variance. Um, we have to look at it relative to the next uh, nearest 10 structures. Um, the one reason why I would be willing to be lax on that requirement in this instance is by virtue of the fact that this was previously considered from the perspective of relocation and this board previously said we'd allow the relocation and you'd only have to go back 17 feet. We're also usually looking at that in the context of an accessory structure and here it's kind of a fairly traditional addition. Although even with <laughs> It, 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 the, yeah, I'd say I'd just note that it also requires changes to the principal structure to be considered. But yeah, your point is taken. Yeah, I mean, generally, you you know, as we know in these cases, you'd have you get ten close <coughs> houses, you'd see what their characteristics are and how many have the same thing. And yep. yep. This is a little, a little actually the there are some houses around it, but. It's not, it's not a subdivision. You know, it's, you got, you got the Lions Club, Club across the street, you got, it's a, it's a funky little area. It, it, this lot is more unusual than most of the lots we're looking at too, yeah. which to me is an additional yeah. mitigating circumstance because the other lots in the neighborhood presumably aren't shaped like this. Right. And just for the applicant's edification, there's a list of criteria we have to look at in making a decision. And normally we're supposed to look at the 10 closest lots and compare them to your lot. But we're kind of waving our hands on that one right now. Uh, the practical difficulty is not a result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Um, did he say it? <laughs> <laughs> You shouldn't have picked it up and moved it, I <laughs> uh, But in fact, it got moved back further than what yeah. they, were, they originally thought it would be placed. So um, there's no feasible alternative to the variance um, is available to the petitioner. And I would say given this nature of the lot, that he's pretty limited in terms of what he can do. Um, and the granting of the variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. I don't think, I don't see any issue there. You've, dri you've driven by the property. I haven't. 
I did. And you would say that criteria is met? Yes. No. No. Uh, okay. And subsection F is obviously met too. Subsection F? Yeah, I knew you were going to. Our, our favorite one. <laughs> I didn't see that one. Did I miss that one? It's, the, it's not in the shoreland areas. <laughs> I hope not, <laughs> for our sake. <laughs> no way. Can't be. Is this your swan song? <laughs> Just saying, dotting eyes. Just a, re a reoccurring That's theme. Fine. That's fine. Fortunately, it is not in the Shoreland <laughs> Overlay District. Okay. Um, so, do I, can I entertain a motion to... Uh, approve uh, the variance request uh, of Mark Toothaker. I'll move to approve the variance, the request of variance. Okay, so Josh is first, Joanna seconded it. Okay, any further discussion? I'll make it very brief. So under the variance section, I just want to understand the, the significance of the statement in the earlier March 2000 document, where it says the relocation to the 17 foot maximum outline, if you will. And for my edification, what's the, the, the significance where it says uh, under 1952 the variance is effective August 2000? So the, the significance for me is that when looking at the same, is it apples for apples when we're talking about the variance or we're merely looking at the outer limit of 17 feet is the significance, not that that was a, a, a variance uh, discussed. It wasn't a variance. Right. So, it was under a different section. So we're not relying on the March 2000 <coughs> document for any basis other than that at the time the board was content that the homeowner could per, could build up to the 17 foot um, boundary, if you will. I think, from my perspective, I was my thinking was twofold: a that that decision indicates that there was a fair amount of inquisition already into what was practical in terms of the neighborhood and its relationship to the neighborhood, and the board determined that kind of a 17 foot setback on. Wheeler Road was what was consistent with the neighborhood and made sense. And so for me, that kind of carries over into not having to delve into that as deeply as we have on some other variance applications because there's already a good source of information in the record indicating that this, even up to 17 foot setback from Wheeler Road is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. So this board is not bound by the previous activity of the board, but we find comfort that that's what they were doing. I did. Fine. Thank you. I agree. That, that, yeah. I've, the reason why that criteria I'm willing to say we don't have the documents in front of us, we do have this decision that implicitly would have taken that into account. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Any, any further discussion? Any, uh, all those in favor of the, uh, the motion? Any opposed? So six zero, and the variance is approved. Okay, I'll just read the finding of fact. Um, this is a variance request for map U16, lot one, two wheeler road, applicant Mark Toothaker. Mark Toothaker is the owner of record for map U16, lot one, two wheeler road. Two wheeler road is a non-conforming lot in the RA district. Required setbacks are 30 feet from Wheeler Road, 40 feet from Two Lights Road, and 20 feet for the remaining rear property line. In order to construct an addition on the side rear of the house, the applicant is requesting a variance that allows a setback of 14 feet. Actually, it's not uh, 14. I always read 14 feet on the Two Lights side of the property, but it's really now 22.9. 22. What was it? Nine. And do we want to have the point nine? Because whenever you build. To, uh, so 23? No, I just say 22. 22. 20 sold. 
Uh, so uh, I'll read that again. In order to construct an addition on the side rear of the house, the applicant has requested <coughs> a variance that allows a setback of 22 feet on the two lights road, two lights road side of the property. Um, conclusions, there's no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance and a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30 dash section blah, 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 blah. Uh, and the decision is uh, six yes votes and none uh, voting no. Chair, I have just, I want to make sure that this is legit. Uh, is that, is the 0.9 a material term for the variance? Because we approved it and then we so had an alteration. Revote, revote with it at 22. So, everyone, so if it's not material, then I, I withdraw my no, that's the, no, that's a good point. I think no. it is. So. Uh, or make a point nine. <laughs> I, I move that we um, approve the application subject to the um, findings of fact that the chair just read out. Okay. A second. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Zero. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, yeah. uh, that concludes our. Um, business for this evening. I wish everybody uh, uh, happy holidays and a happy new year and we'll see you next year with a new chairman. <laughs>